Hey everyone, I am really excited to have this opportunity to be able to preach today and I can't wait to explore scripture with you all as we look at together how we are one body in Christ and each given different spiritual gifts for his will and purpose. But before we begin, I would love to just take some time now and pray. Hey God, thank you for this opportunity to be able to preach. I pray, Lord, that as I speak, that your will be done, Lord. May you speak through me and may you open up the hearts and the um, ears of this community, Lord, as we listen to what you are saying through me, Lord. I pray that you take away any nerves and you just allow me to be a light and a voice for you in this moment now, Lord. Amen. All right, I have a question for each of you, something that I want you guys to be thinking about. Do you know where you belong in the church community? Do you know what your role is within the church, how you are called to serve? I used to think that it wasn't everyone's job to have a job in the church. I thought that there were goers and then there were doers. People whose job it was to just attend church and be a part of the community. And then there were people who were called and gifted to run church and run the community stuff. But God actually calls each of us to actively be serving and working in the church. Each of us has a place. And maybe you feel like you can't preach on Sunday or you can't sing or play an instrument or you don't know how to run the tech stuff. So there isn't really a place for you in all those jobs that are already taken. But church isn't just about the couple of hours that we spend on a Sunday in the building or online. It's about the people, each of us individually together as one. We all have our differences, our different gifts and talents, our different lives and ways of thinking, but that shouldn't be something that stops us from being a church family. In fact, it should be what causes us to celebrate because it is because of our differences that we can be strong as a church family. My family is a beautiful group of people who have very different lives, very different interests and very, very different looks. I have six siblings and there are a few of us who don't look anything alike. My father is Chilean and my mum is Australian. I have four younger siblings who all look very similar to each other and no one has ever mistaken them for not being related. They have dark brown hair and tan skin and they clearly got all of the Chilean genes. Then there is my older brother and I with our light skin covered in freckles and our orange curly hair. And then my oldest brother with his light brown hair. And so often people who didn't know us wouldn't realize that all seven of us are actually related. Something that I will never forget growing up was when in our school years, my sister and I would have to show people our student IDs to prove that we were actually sisters because otherwise no one believed us. I went through childhood having to convince people on the outside of my family that we were all related, that we were a family because we just, we didn't look all the same. And this got me thinking about the church as a family. And I feel like we don't really have to convince people outside of the church that we are a community so much because they often see the church services happening on a Sunday and maybe the occasional church event. And for them, maybe that is what it means to be a part of a church community. But within the walls and the family of the church, I've noticed that sometimes we have to convince or reassure people in our community or even ourselves that we belong in this church family, that we have a place, that we have value, or that there is something that we have to offer and that we are just as important when it comes to church life as everyone else. In fact, this is something that people in churches have struggled with for years and years, trying to find a place to belong and feel important in a huge family, which is usually full of gifted preachers and incredible worshipers and amazing evangelists and people who are powerful in their prayers and many people with many other godly gifts and talents. And Paul writes a letter to the Corinthians who were struggling with this in their own church community. And he is trying to remind them that each of them are one body in Christ, a part of a family together. That it didn't matter who they were or what spiritual gifts they did or didn't have. 
that each person belonged and each person was valued and important because God created them specifically with their gifts and their skills to use for him as a part of the body of Christ. And I want to look at that today with you guys about what it means to be a part of the body of Christ with our different gifts and our different talents, why unity and fellowship as one body between Christians is so important and how it affects and changes our relationship with God and with others. We are going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul begins this chapter by looking at how the Corinthian Christians past teachings and experiences may have led them to a lack of understanding of the Holy Spirit and of the gifts of the Spirit, which created a belief that certain Christians in their community were superior and above others because of their spiritual giftings. Let's read from the beginning of the chapter. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spirit, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Paul is emphasizing that one and the same God is in each of the different gifts of the Spirit. That each gift comes from God, even though they all have different purposes and use, and they all look different from one another. In this section right here, Paul highlights so well the Trini how the Trinity is present in the gifts of the Spirit and how it works through those gifts. The Holy Spirit gives us the different gifts. Jesus shows us and teaches us how to live out these gifts in our services and ministry and just life in general. And God works through all of that for his glory and purpose for each and every different gift. The Trinity is working through each person for each gift. And there is diversity between the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ and God in the Trinity. But this diversity is used to enhance the power and majesty of the Trinity, not to diminish it. And this should be reflected in the diversity of gifts in the body of Christ, which is what Paul is trying to say. He wants the Corinthian Christians to understand how their unity with one another can be enhanced because of the different gifts that God has given each of them. Paul then goes on to list what each of the gifts of the Spirit are. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. These gifts are given not according to the will of man, so we can't just get them whenever we want because we want it. We are able to get the gifts of the Spirit when and only when God wants us to and gives it to us according to the will of God. And we need to be reminded that sometimes, if not often, the will and the wisdom of God is different to our will and our wisdom. And so we should never assume that the gifts are distributed as we would distribute them. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 highlights this as it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We don't receive a gift of the Spirit based off of our position in the church or the amount of ministries we're involved in or how well we know the Bible. It's about the position and the attitude of our heart and our desire. Do you desire to serve God? Do you desire to be a part of God's plan and his purpose? Is your heart attitude one of love? To love God and to love others, to show others the love of God. 
Growing up, I went to a youth group which was very large, maybe close to about 40 youth at some point. And this youth group focused very strongly on the gift of tongues and having the spiritual gift of tongues. There were talks and there were times of worship and prayer where the main focus was on everyone asking God for the gift of tongues and then speaking and praying in tongues. And for years, I would be there and I would be surrounded by all of these youth and everyone was crying and praying and speaking in tongues. And not once during my time in that youth group did I ever experience that for myself. I spent a good portion of my younger youth years wondering, why me? What is wrong with me? Why is God doing this for everyone else? And yet year after year without fail, I would stand there praying for and desiring this gift and be surrounded by these prayers and worship. And yet I would feel so out of place, like it was my fault that I didn't belong. It wasn't until years later that I began to realize and be taught that, yes, the gift of tongues is an incredible spiritual gift and an important one, but so is every other gift as well. And instead of praying and longing for a gift so that I could be like everyone else and because I saw that other people were receiving this gift, I began to ask God for different gifts so that his glory and his plan and his purpose would be revealed through me and the gifts that he decided to give me. And I stopped wanting a gift so that I would fit in and started wanting a gift so that I could stand out. Not so that people would see me, but instead that they would see God working through me through these gifts. And that is when I started to see a change in my heart and in my life. My perspective and my understanding of the different gifts shifted from placing them in a ranking order and looking at, and, and to looking at them each individually and important and needed equal to each, to each other. Sorry. The gifts of the spirit are for God's will and his purpose. So then how do we know if we are using the gifts of the Spirit for God's will and his purpose? Well, Jesus says that when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will testify about him. John 15, 26 says, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And not only will the Holy Spirit testify about Jesus, but Jesus also says that the Holy Spirit will glorify him too, because the Holy Spirit will take what is his and will declare it to us. John 16, 14 talks about this as it says, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The work of the Holy Spirit through the gifts of the Holy Spirit is not about promoting any one person but to glorify and represent Jesus. So when the Holy Spirit is truly at work, it will be according to the nature of Jesus, promoting and glorifying him. And when I started to ask God for spiritual gifts that he wanted me to have, and because I wanted them so that I could serve him and give him all the glory, well, incredible things started to happen. Not only was I witnessing the power of God moving in my life and the lives of those around me, but I began to honestly feel like I belonged and I was connected to the body of Christ. Being who I was meant to be for God as part of the body of the church. Not because I was the same as everyone else, but because I was actually very different and fulfilling exactly what God wanted me to be, what God wanted me to. And I'm not just talking about the big and incredible miraculous stuff that happens, which is amazing and incredible, but I'm talking about me just accepting who I am, accepting my gifts and my talents that God has given me and using them for him to draw me into a deeper relationship with him and to be a part and to be the part that I'm supposed to be as part of the body of Christ. I didn't want the spiritual gifts everyone around me wanted and had anymore. I didn't need to be the head or the hand or the mouth or the body anymore. I just wanted to be part of the body, knowing that wherever I was, I was just as valuable and important as every single other part. And as we continue to read in the chapter in 1 Corinthians, we begin to look at why each of us are given different gifts and how each of us individually are a vital part of the body of Christ because of our differences not in spite of them.
1 Corinthians 12 from verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I, didn't need, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts yet I will show you the most excellent way. When we become a Christian and commit our lives to God, there is a cleansing and a renewing, a baptism that the Holy Spirit does in us and it unites us to the body of Christ, which is also uniting us to one another as believers. And it is the same Holy Spirit that does that to all of us when we take that step. Which means that all of us are united together in one body by one spirit for God. But even though together we are one body, we are not all made up of one part. Because just like a human body is one but has many different parts, so does the body of Christ. And God has put the body together so that all its parts should be equal to one another. If this is true for the body, then that means that this is true for each of us. That God has put each of us together as the body of Christ so that we are all equal and no person is greater or less than any other. And this body-like unity of, Christ of Christians is not just a goal that we are meant to achieve. It is a fact that we need to recognize. We are one body in Christ. It isn't that we should be or here's how we can make it happen. It's a fact that we already are and that we always will be. There are gifts and talents that we each have that were given to us by God when we were born. They are a part of our identity. An example of these gifts would be some people are gifted artists and others have amazing singing voices and some people have a natural ability to be compassionate or understanding. There are many things that make each person unique to the next person, all of which are important and given to us to be used for God's glory and purpose. Then, as we have been talking about, there are also gifts of the Spirit. Gifts given to us on top of our natural gifts by the Holy Spirit that God uses to work through us. And often our natural gifts and abilities and the spiritual gifts that we are given can work together for God's perfect purpose. God wants us to be asking him for the different gifts of the Spirit. There isn't just one gift for one person and that is it. All gifts are made available to God's people. But we aren't meant to be desiring or placing one or two gifts above all others either. We need to remember and recognize that each gift is just as equal and just as important as all the other gifts are. 
When I think about how we all share one purpose and are all a part of the one body of Christ, but we are all different at the same time, I actually, I think of a puzzle. Each piece of a puzzle is different. There are no two pieces that are alike. And yet every piece has its place in the puzzle, a job that it has to do. And one piece cannot perform the specific job of another piece because it isn't the correct shape or color or size. And a puzzle cannot be fully completed unless every single piece is there doing the job that it was designed to do. Fulfilling the role that it was shaped and colored and specifically cut out and created to do. In order for the body to effectively be a body, it must have the different parts. If a body were all hands or all eyes, well, it wouldn't work very well at all. Not only is diversity in the body of Jesus Christ acceptable, it is actually essential. And as members of Christ's body, we are his hands and his feet and his eyes and his heart. He works through us in the world. We've been looking at the, books of, the book of Acts for a while now. And as we go through Acts, we see that the disciples and the Christians were very specific in their commitment to each other. They were so devoted to fellowship. In Romans 12 verse 5, we read, In Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. They understood that the parts of the body work together. The eyes and the ears do not only serve themselves, but the whole body. The hands do not only feed and defend themselves, but the whole body. And the heart does not only supply blood to itself, but serves the whole body. The purpose of the gifts is to build up one another and to care for one another, not to flaunt your own spirituality. The phrase one another or each other is used over 50 times in the New Testament. We are commanded to love each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other and advise each other and greet each other. We're encouraged to serve each other and to teach each other, to accept each other and to honor each other, bearing each other's burdens and forgiving each other and submitting to each other, to be devoted to each other and more. Being a member of the church means being a vital organ of a living body, an indispensable interconnected part of the body of Christ. And for the parts of your body to be able to fulfill their purpose, they must be connected to the body. If an organ is somehow taken from its body, it will die. It cannot exist on its own and neither can you or me. Our spiritual gifts are meant to be used together, not, as, not against each other and not alone. And when we struggle with fellowship with one another, when we fail to be one body as a church, it affects our relationship with God. Our individual, personal relationship with God is affected when we are not in unity, when we aren't one in the body of Christ. And just as we are all different in our gifts and talents, so does a body have many different parts. But just as each part of the body is important for different reasons, so are each of us. And in fact, it is our differences that unite us, bringing us all together. It is because we are different that we are all needed. God wants all areas and bases covered, and that can't be done with people who are all the same. When you ignore your calling or you decide you don't want it, it doesn't just affect your life. It can affect the entire body of Christ. When you enter into the body of Christ, it is no longer just about you. Just as when we accept God into our lives, it becomes about him and his plan and his will for us. Being a part of the body of Christ means the way we serve and live for God impacts those around us, those outside of the body who are yet to know God, and those who are in the body of Christ, and how they and ourselves have a relationship with God and with others. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. Paul finishes this chapter by stating that there is more to just seeking the gifts of the Spirit and being in one body with each other. And as you continue to read the book, it shows us that this more is love. That the spiritual gifts are just ways that we can express and receive love from God and love to one another. They are like containers which hold love inside to be given, experienced and used. So my question to all of us 
is, are you using your godly gifts and talents as part of the body of Christ in unity with other believers for the glory of God? And also, how do you rate your value? Does it come from comparing yourself to others or does your value come directly from God? Maybe you are in a position or ministry in the body of Christ because you wanted to be and you felt like you should be, but maybe it isn't actually where God wants you to be. We need to be double checking and rechecking with God. You could be trying to be a foot when God has called you to be a hand, or you could be ignoring the call for you to be an eye because you so desperately want to be a leg. We need to be asking ourselves these questions so that we are allowing God to guide us so that we can live our lives according to his plan and his purpose for us as disciples, as his children, and as one body in Christ. Let's pray. Hey God, may you speak to each of us today, Lord. May your Holy Spirit come and rest in our hearts and may we... Hear your voice, Lord, as, as you call us, as you reassure us, as you lead us into the purpose and plan that you have for us, Lord. If there are areas of our lives, Lord, that aren't bringing you glory and honour, we pray, Lord, that you will reveal to that to us so that we are able to work with you to fix that. May you draw us all together into one body in Christ, Lord. May we love each other and care for each other and recognize the importance of um, our fellowship and our unity together, Lord, so that together we can strengthen each other and grow in serving you, Lord, so that your will and your purpose may be above all else in our church family, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen.